these two guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. It might be one day late, but it's going to be chock full of information. I'll tell you that. Bonus scoop time. Judd Declan and Darren Doogie Wolfson, Channel 5 Eyewitness News. And also, of course, Scoop Podcast uh, Hall of Famer because, my God, he's like on 500 or something like that. I'm going to give you a ton of credit. Um, Let's start with this. Let's start with football because two weeks from tomorrow, which is Thursday, we are going to be, uh, Darren, at the the Park Tavern uh, for our Surly Draft Party, which, of course, it's going to be Phil, it's going to be yours truly. It's going to be Declan and hopefully you as well. No admission, so there's not, none, none of this U.S. Bank Stadium huge cover charge. If you want to watch the talent, it's going to cost you a lot. No, there's going to be no talent. Just a bunch of friends. Park Tavern, St. Louis Park, 11th frame. What can you tell us? And excuse the two, two dogs. Stella has her friend here, and they are both going crazy right now. But there's nothing I can do about it. So I, like Chris Finch, have lost control of my house uh, but let's start with Vikings. What would you what would what would you bring to the table right now, Dugs, as far as the steam as we uh, get closer to the draft? Absolutely. Good afternoon, Judd. Hello, Declan. Happy Hump Day. Apologies for not joining you yesterday, Tuesday, like I normally do. Life got in the way, but thankfully we were able to shift to today. I'll still do my normal two hits a week with you this week. We'll either do it again tomorrow, or if we want to shift it to Friday. That is fine. So the Vikings are hosting a bunch of draft prospects. Heck, right now, like I just got a text, Trey Palmer, LSU, Nebraska, kick returner, wide receiver. He is at TCO Performance Center right now. The headline guys to me are Tanner McKee, quarterback, Stanford. Now, I'll defer to our guy Thor Nystrom, or heck, I'm catching up early next week with my guy Jordan Reed of ESPN. I'll catch up soon with Rick Spielman. But now does a bunch of draft work, the former Vikings GM. He does some draft work for CBS Sports. So I'll defer to them on where you would rank McKee. Like, is he quarterback five, quarterback six, quarterback nine, quarterback ten? But he's up there. He's like in that second to third tier. So he's one of the bigger names out there. Jordan Addison, wide receiver USC. Quinton Johnston, wide receiver TCU. Keon White, pass rusher Georgia Tech. From what I can gather... Those would be the biggest names. John Michael Schmitz, as well, to me, the best center in the draft. So it's just, it's a busy stretch right now. The Vikings gathering all sorts of information. They constantly watch these guys, right? At the hotel, at the facility, how they interact with each other, how they interact with staff members. Heck, junior staff members, it's one thing to treat Quasi a certain way. You treat, you know, you name the low level scout or the intern. The same way. Do you treat equipment guy Dennis Ryan the same way as you treat better we see Kevin O'Connell, right? They're constantly watching these guys, right? That's part of this evaluation process. So that's what's keeping the Vikings very busy right now. We'll get some time with Kevin O'Connell with Quasi Adolfo Mensa on Thursday afternoon. That will be the last time we converse with those guys before the draft. Tan McKee, possibly what right? Right now, projected third round pick. Is that I think correct, he's in that dude? ballpark, right? Maybe I mean, depending second? on what you think of the UCLA quarterback, what you think of the Fresno quarterback, but yeah, somewhere in that mix. I mean, depending on what mock draft you want to trust, quarterbacks are goofy too, right? I mean, you know, not every team is seeking a backup type quarterback or a developmental type quarterback. And so these guys can start falling. But yeah, I think there's a decent chance he goes day two not day three, but somewhere in that, you know, 75-ish to 105, 110-ish range in terms of picks. So whether that's mid-third, late third, early on Saturday in the fourth round, somewhere in that ballpark. So you you uh, broached the fact that you're going to be talking to uh, former Viking GM Rick Spielman in the next week or so. I think it's I think it's important to note, too, don't be afraid because Kellen Mond didn't work in the th- third round and proved to be a terrible pick. Don't be afraid of that pick, though. Like, that is, if you have faith that O'Connell can identify quarterbacks, which that's his position, right? Um, that's a pretty sweet spot if you can get that right. So, so like, Mond didn't work. It was just an 
abject failure, uh, probably, unfortunately, from the word go. But I would say, while Spielman got that pick wrong, I think the the thought process behind it is pretty good. So, like, that makes sense. If you take this kid and you like him and he sits behind Kirk, that could be a pretty smart move. I'm not saying it works for sure. I don't love, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be a starter, but I do think that if you have the right person making the pick and then most importantly, Dukes developing him, right? Because I mean, Mond, did Mond get any help here? I have no idea. Certainly didn't appear so. I think that that is the right spirit of if we're not going to take one high, it's at least worth trying to take some shots third or fourth round. That's why I'm thinking more and more, Judd, that developmental quarterback comes now, not in 2024. Just based on all the diligence being done on so many quarterbacks going back many weeks, Anthony Richardson, okay, the Vikings are not going to be in the vicinity of drafting the Florida quarterback. Although I have been asked a bunch on social media, Judd. So Adam Schefter puts out that report, right, about six teams communicating with the Arizona Cardinals. Their new front office, their new GM, Monty, Minnesota native, by the way, small world. Monty was in the mix for the Vikings GM job before it went to Quasi. But anyway, I've been asked, hey, do you have any sense if the Vikings are one of those six teams that Schefter has alluded to that has spoken with Arizona trying to get all the way up to pick three? I know you guys on Purple Daily did an exercise where you guys, what, executed a trade where you moved up. To number three, I don't know all the particulars. I'm imagining what the 24 first round pick, this year's first round pick. Hick, did you also give up the 25 first round pick or the third round pick this year? But you gave up a handful of picks. You moved up to pick three with who? CJ Stroud somehow falling to pick three. So Stroud doesn't go one, doesn't go two. Very intriguing. Although I just I haven't heard legit buzz about the Vikings being one of those six teams. But regardless, whether it's at pick 23, whether the Vikings move back from 23, accumulate some more picks in the third, move up from where they are in the third. I'm just thinking more and more based on the work being done and all these quarterbacks that that developmental guy is coming now, not a year from now. I'll also say on Kellen Mond, so Hugh Jackson was training him pre-draft, the former Browns coach. One of Mike Zimmer's guys from their time in Cincinnati together. Like, I don't know. I mean, Hugh was huge on Kellen. Did Mike have a good amount of influence on Rick, others in the front office, from the dialogue with Hugh? There's just, there's some things I wonder about in that regard. To answer your question, though, undoubtedly, no. The answer is no. Kellen did not get enough help here when he was a Viking. A little bit of a rhetorical question here, Dukes, but with Zimmer being a very defensive base guy and, you know, Kevin O'Connell being the offensive first guy. Can you remember the last time? Cause the Vikings have been doing a lot of due diligence at the rookie quarterback position going into this draft. Can you remember the last time they did this amount of due diligence in rookie quarterbacks? Obviously they made the Teddy pick in 2014 and, you know, they reached for ponder at 11, but I feel like it's been a long time since the Vikings have been connected to so many quarterbacks. Yes, I want to say the Bridgewater year, the Ponder year. Heck, there might have been one year after. Was it the 18 draft or the 17 draft? But yes, I mean, to answer your question, Declan, my sense is they've done as much work on quarterbacks this pre-draft period as any in recent memory. Certainly more this year, this regime, more this year, compared to last year. They did a decent amount last year, but my sense is much more this year. That's why I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm starting to sense more and more. I don't have this 100% locked down, right? Maybe this fits more the theme of reckless speculation Thursday, but here on this hump day Wednesday, I'm just telling you, 15 days out, I just think that development of quarterback is coming this year. So I think part of our problem too, though, is we we think of, of this in a straight line, which is if you draft, you know, if you draft a quarterback, that's your guy, right? I think teams now and smart teams and teams like this are much more open minded to why not take like if we think that McKee can be developed behind Kirk, which by the way you've got, you know, and and this whole whole thing, and I, I think I 
talked uh, to you about this last week, Dukes, this whole thing about, well, is Kirk going to help? It doesn't matter if Kirk helps or not. Like, if Kirk helps, that's great. But Kevin O'Connell develops him. So I well, think I mean, our, Kirk is not going to sabotage the well, situation. Well, right, exactly. But, but I know Kirk well enough. In love. He's playing for the next contract. Trust me, Kirk's no. not going to be some sort of a hole in that in that quarterback room. I promise you that. And we fall so in love though with is he going to help out? Okay, Kevin O'Connell's going to help out. But anyway, the point is, I think we think well. But if McKee fails, what's going to happen? If McKee fails, they'll take another quarterback, and it might be a first round guy. Like you do have to shoot shots here. Um, and with Rick, it felt like, okay, I shot my shot. That's it. I don't think that's how teams think now. I think that the evolution of the quarterback is, um, not to be dumb with your picks, but to certainly take shots. And so if they take McKee third round, he develops awesome. If he doesn't, no one gets fired. McKee probably gets cut at some point or traded and they take a quarterback again, and again, it might be a first round pick. So I think we need to change our thinking from how Rick did things to like how crazy and just as importantly, Kevin O'Connell are going to do things. Yeah, amen. I mean, no doubt about that. I mean, heck, if you hit the jackpot multiple years, you know, in a row or separated by one year, guess what? I mean, you can always trade a guy, right? So right. yes, I think that's that's spot on, Judd, that this regime is willing to take some shots. They know they've got a good amount of leeway. It's not like Quasey is in any sort of trouble anytime soon. Kevin is not in trouble anytime soon. The Wilfs are not looking to make, you know, wholesale changes every other year, something crazy like that. They want sustained runs in the front office with the coaching staff. I just, I get that sense. Heck, we saw it, right? I mean, Spielman was here for a long time. Zim was here. For a long time. So, yes, that would also then feed more into now, right? I mean, what's the sense of waiting another year? Take that shot now. I'm just, I'm wondering if they take the shot at 23, Judd, or do they try to move up from 23? You know, if Hendon Hooker is indeed their guy, or do they wait for one of these other guys, whether it's the UCLA quarterback or the Stanford quarterback or maybe somebody else? Interesting stuff. Um, and any updates on uh, Dalvin Cook and Hunter, just as far as contracts and, and in Cook's place uh, or in in Cook's uh, circumstances, the fact that it does feel like there is a move there yet to come. We've talked about this a lot, but as the draft approaches, I was just curious if there's new speculation about Dalvin Cook's future with the Vikings. No, no new speculation. I think things will become – a bit more clear post-draft. I still don't necessarily see Dalvin here opening week, so I'll continue to say that. On Daniil, we know that that low base salary is just not a thing that we right. see him playing under, and so how does that situation play out? I did hear that Brian Flores is really, really pumped up to coach Daniil. That Daniil, it's mutual, is pumped up to play under Brian Flores. So do the Vikings find a way to give him some sort of bump, extend him? I think that will play out come May and June, maybe into July. But on Dalvin, nothing new, you know, in the last, you know, since we last did one of these, I guess last, what, Thursday. But I still don't necessarily see him here. Scooby. Much like your dogs. Yeah. He must have heard Scooby. about your dogs. Stella's yeah. got a friend here. They're, they're Is our just... mailwoman? Nope. Mailman. Okay. Amazon? All right. Yeah. Mailman. No, not yeah, anymore. Laura's got some more stuff being dropped off at your door, <laughs> like Don does. It's unbelievable. Every day we're like a clearinghouse. Dex, Correct. The other thing we're dealing with here is we're one of these streets here in the West Metro that is getting beaten up this summer. So we live on the corner. So we have to deal with it two consecutive summers. Mm -hmm. You know, the street that you know you walk out our front door, that street will get some work done next summer. You go out our driveway, that street's getting ripped up this summer so that work is like underway right now so thankfully it's not too loud right this second but may into june into july it's going to be really really loud i think i'll be joining you guys in studio more often uh dukes not to put you too much on the spot have you heard uh the status of brian o'neill uh in his rehab process from the q has there been any new steam or, or update on on his recovery from that injury yeah so not a fully torn achilles declan it was legitimately partially torn. There is a difference. I'm not going to go into all the medical terminology, but 
I was at a session with Kevin O'Connell, some other people a couple weeks ago at TCO Performance Center with the training staff. So O'Neill's situation specifically came up, just such an atypical injury, just in terms of an offensive lineman. You know, it happened, what, on New Year's Day at Lambeau Field, running all the way down the field after, what, an interception. Just an offensive lineman doesn't run that long of a distance very often. But thankfully, it wasn't fully torn. My understanding, Declan, is the way it was described to us was he is ahead of schedule. Now, you're not going to see him active. We'll get some face time with the Vikings here in the next couple weeks with the offseason program beginning on Monday. It's not like you're going to see him active when we're out there in Egan the next few weeks, but there is hope that come August, September, he's going to be okay, be back for week one. All right, let's turn our attention to the Minnesota Timberwolves, who had a, what, a, I believe a 15-point lead at one point against the Lakers in their first playoff game, a chance to go directly to the playoffs and play Memphis. Everything looked good. The Lakers couldn't make a three-pointer to save their lives. And then the Timberwolves uh, playing w- without Gobert, playing without McDaniels, playing without Nas Reed, fell apart uh, and lose in OT, and now will play in another playing game on Friday to decide their season against the winner of tonight's OKC New Orleans Pelicans game. Uh, Dukes, we haven't talked to you since the S hit the fan on Sunday. What can you tell us? What do you know? And I guess I'll start you with this one. Gobert, does he now come back from his one-game exile on Friday? Yes, Rudy Gobert is expected to play on Friday against, as you said, the winner of tonight's Pelicans Thunder game. But make no mistake about this. I was told, heck, going back to Sunday, that his back is pretty messed up. In fact, he was not going to play on Sunday against the Pelicans. Kyle Anderson had a lot to do with Gobert playing. Kyle Anderson riding him pretty good pregame saying, hey, Rudy, we need this game. We need you out there. You need to find a way to play. And so he plays. But the back is pretty messed up, as we all know. Back injury is incredibly tricky, very easy to re-injure, re-aggravate. But yes, my understanding is Rudy will be good to go in some capacity on Friday night at Target Center. I'll tell you what, on J.D. McDaniels, and I think our mutual friend Johnny Krasinski put something on Twitter. I was hoping to save it for when I was going to join you guys yesterday. Now it's today. But I told some people in the the Twins press box on, when was I over there? I guess it would have been, what, Monday's day game that I'd spoken with somebody that would know, that would have intimate knowledge with the Wolves. He told me, yeah, I mean, Jaden didn't know that behind that curtain is brick. It's concrete. Like, that's a brick wall. Like, clearly he's not punching that curtain if he knew what was behind said curtain. So just so unfortunate that Jaden goes down. But on Kyle and Rudy, that thing was escalating for a while. Now, Kyle, I'll tell you what. Like, you go back to the Sacramento game a couple weeks ago, they had a moment in that game where they were embracing, right? Kumbaya. We love each other, right? So it's been that sort of roller coaster relationship. but. My understanding is what took place on Sunday was escalating for a while. Doesn't, like, justify what Rudy did. It didn't even make sense to me. Like, if you're going to punch somebody, like, aren't you going for the face? Like, if you're making that decision, don't you, like, really want to do some damage? Like, I don't even understand the rationale behind the punch, which was almost a push. You know, then Tim Connolly's decision to suspend Rudy, like Draymond Green clocks Jordan Poole in October with the Warriors. Draymond didn't serve a suspension. Now, again, even if Rudy was okay to play last night, not sure how much he would have contributed last night because of the back issue. But just kind of odd to me that they made the decision to suspend him. It's not like they had to. It's not like the league says, okay, punch thrown, automatic suspension. This was a Wolves decision, not a league decision. Don't you think it was probably because the Jordan Poole Draymond thing, I believe, happened in a practice and this happened in front of 19,000 people? Like that was my well, I mean, plus they sent him home like he's in third grade. Conley, what, what they because did they almost got in another fight in the locker room, correct? At halftime, and yeah, Conley they were mother and said, Go each home. other. Yeah, in fact, somebody told me somebody I was talking with with the Wolves, are you aware, Declan? You might know better than 
Judd and I just being maybe a little bit more active on Instagram and TikTok, but that there's audio. Somebody recorded the audio in the back area. Are you I aware heard of it. this? You I've did? Heard oh, it you heard it. Real. Okay. I've not heard if it If it's yet. real. Well, somebody told me somebody did record audio. Okay. It's I don't know Kyle. if that's the audio that's out there. So I'd have to listen for myself, do a little bit more deep diving on that. But somebody told me somebody did record audio. And okay. so audio exists somewhere. So, yeah, I don't know if it's that audio, though. But, yeah, it did carry over into the back. Rudy had to be escorted to his car. You know, some other people packed some stuff up for him. So it was a quick, Rudy, let's get you out of this arena. And so, yeah, I mean, it was a complete cluster bleep, right? But, like, we're used to dysfunction with this franchise. Yeah, They lead the league in technical fouls, in ejections, in flagrant fouls, right? They darn near lead the league in meltdowns. What I mean by that is blowing double-digit leads. They've blown 19 of them for losses this season. They've blown a bunch of fourth-quarter double-digit leads. It's either 10 or 11 after last night. Only Portland has blown more leads. So they've been an emotional roller coaster all season long. So what took place last Sunday, Judd, shouldn't really like shock anybody. It really shouldn't. Dukes, I know he asked you this last week, and I know he was extended He's being dealt a pretty uh, a poor hand with these injuries that have piled up and Nas Reed and Jada McDaniels and Gobert. If the Wolves don't find themselves in the playoffs by Sunday, and I just saw the time slap, by the way, uh, fellas, it is a 9.30 uh, tip-off, I believe, for Denver Nuggets and whoever they host on Sunday. So that'll be a late game. But if the Wolves are not in the play-in, this is the status of Chris Finch. Is it any more up in the air than it was a week ago or – or previously, what would be the status of him if the Wolves don't find themselves in the playoffs? I still don't sense that Glenn Taylor is willing to cut the check. There's still enough to like about Chris. I still think there's a really good offensive mind there. Hey, how about you know just finding a way to get Mike Conley Jr. to the free throw line at the end of regulation last night? There is some good. But yes, ultimately, the team is a reflection of you. And when these technicals are piling up, these emotional breakdowns, Heck, just even jump shot after jump shot in the fourth quarter last night, the final eight minutes of regulation, it was either a turnover or a 22-foot jump shot. Like, what? But, heck, Chris has like nine assistant coaches. I mean, all these NBA teams now have literally a coach for every player. Isn't there <laughs> any dialogue amongst the staff? I heard Mike Nori, who to me is brilliant. Like, I think Mike Nori, Wolves assistant coach, is super, super smart. I heard him at halftime with Alan Horton on the radio call last night, breaking down the first half. I learned so much. Well, Micah, like, Micah, what are you doing in game? Is there any communication there with Chris? What exactly is taking place for it to unfold the way it did? But Declan, I just don't sense that Glenn, who's still the majority owner until either December 31st of this year or March of 2024, so 11 months from now, that Glenn is willing to cut a check to send Chris Finch on his way. But I will tell you, maybe this absolutely fits more the Reckless Speculation Thursday theme. Nothing is happening immediately with Tim Connolly, but I do wonder about his future eventually. There's just, there's some things, there's a job, Eastern Conference, that if that opens up a year from now, put it this way, I just think the next year, is going to be as fascinating as it is right now with the Wolves. I actually think the next year, this time next year, has a chance to be way, way, way more fascinating. The problem now, too, is, um, you, you know, I will say this. It certainly does not appear that Chris Finch has control of his team. There's emotional highs, and then th there's these lulls that he complains about, but they're partially on him. But, you know, Dugues, to your point, if we're parsing out blame here, Finch gets blame. I get that. But Tim Conley does too, because the guy that you basically mortgaged the future of the franchise for just didn't travel to your play in game. And, and he could have helped you probably because he punched a teammate. So like, that's the, that's the thing too here is like who takes the fall, which is why I think you're right. I think at this point, nobody does eventually 
somebody could. And then there's the whole thing about, you know, cat here. I, I, I mean, does cat, you bring cat back. Do you try and trade cat? There's just so many things that I, I think you're spot on. I think the next year, and this sounds depressing because th this was supposed to be a 50 win team that sort of had its future set. But I think the next year, just from a, uh, uh, president of basketball operations standpoint, from a coach standpoint, from some of your key personnel standpoint, I think it's going to be extremely interesting because I don't think we'll see the status quo in a year, if that makes well, sense. Agree. Now, do I think Tim Connolly is getting fired? No, I think it would be some other job opens up. Right. I got you. That is way more appealing. It's a mutual parting. Hey, Tim. You bleeped things up with the Gobert trade here. Yes, go ahead. We'll send you on your way. By the way, Tim should deserve some credit for the Mike Conley Jr. trade, right? I mean, Mike Conley Jr. has yeah. been a godsend in yeah. so many ways. But, yeah, I mean, ultimately he'll be judged by the Gobert trade. We're all defend Finch. So Cat was brilliant the first three quarters. They did not lose last night because of Cat. Now, I thought the fifth foul – not getting in position to box out Anthony Davis and tossing Davis to the side. Come on, Cat. Then he played right. passive, right? Because he had five fouls. Right. He was fearful that if he drove the ball to the basket, he would get called for an offensive foul. He would foul out of the game. But trust me, like he had Rui Hachimura on the block, passes out. He had Austin Reeves one-on-one. Yeah. Yes. -on -one. Switched on. And he's him. settling for a 24-foot jump shot. That's not on Chris. Like, Cat can go attack. Chris wants Cat to attack. So how exactly is that Chris Finch's fault? I just have a hard time on that one. But I'm telling you, I'm not blaming. I'm really not. I'm not blaming Cat. They did not lose that game last night because of Cat. They but they really could have won it. He was so good. Sure, they but could have won. won it two shots in the fourth, fourth quarter. quarter in overtime. He didn't yep. score in the fourth quarter and overtime. So sure, when you have, what, 24 or 25 points through three quarters – there is an expectation that, hey, come the fourth quarter, I'll take my game yet to another level. Yep. Let me lead us to victory. We were up by 15 points in the third quarter. We were up 10 with nine minutes to go. And it really set up pretty nicely. Like, to me, you wanted to be on that side of the bracket. I would not have been scared of a Memphis rematch. No Brandon Clark. No Steven Adams. Yep. To me, I would have said, you know what? I'll take my chances with the Memphis Grizzlies. Now, best case, you win on Friday, then you get the one seed Denver Nuggets. I'm sorry, even if you get to that playoff series, maybe you win a game or two, but you're not beating the Denver Nuggets four times. So it'll be one and done. But can you imagine the disaster, Judd, if they somehow <laughs> lose on Friday, then enter the lottery? Oh, my God. It would almost be right? fitting, for though. somebody who roots for storylines, right? You almost want them in the lottery. Then... You know, they go to commercial break, then unveil the final four picks. You want the Wolves to somehow leap up, give Utah. <laughs> if it's the fourth pick, fine. But you Tell want that drama. Pick. You want that drama on lottery night when they go to commercial and the Wolves are one of the top four teams, right? Before those envelopes are opened, right? You want the Wolves to be one of those four, knowing that that pick is going to Utah. And who knows? Yeah. Then at that point, you've got the 25% chance. It's the number one pick for this transformational prospect. This seven foot three, you know, uh, I don't even know how to describe him, right? Cyborg from Paris, who dribbles like a point guard, who shoots it like a shooting guard. He's got three point range, but he's got these long arms. He's going to block a bunch of shots. Heck, he takes a shot in a game the other day from three point range, a couple strides. He follows his shot, knowing the shot wasn't going to go in couple strides, follow-up, dunk. Like this seven-foot-three kid is off the charts. No guarantees he's going to be a superstar, but he is one of the better prospects entering the draft in a long time. That includes Zion. That includes Anthony Edwards. Maybe we have to go back to Anthony Davis or maybe as far back as LeBron James, but that's the type of prospect this kid Victor is. Could you imagine that scenario Hell yes, the Wolves, the Wolves. Lose on Friday night? Of course I could. All right, final scoops before we let you go. Sure. So some local draft notes. Evan Hall from Maple Grove High School, Northwestern. He is visiting the Packers later this week, visited the Vikings earlier this week. 
former Gophers quarterback Tanner Morgan visiting the Packers later this week. He'll throw, he'll visit the Cincinnati Bengals next week, also throw for the Cincinnati Bengals. The Gophers basketball team will host a recruit on Saturday, Latrell Wrightsell Jr., a transfer from Cal State Fullerton, first team, all Big West, averaged 16 points a game. Last year can play the one, can play the two, has two years of eligibility remaining, has started games the last three years for Cal State Fullerton. It's down in Nebraska, Minnesota, maybe Alabama, but it looks like it's down to the Cornhuskers and Gophers. He is from Omaha, Nebraska. He will visit Nebraska before he visits the Gophers. That will come on Friday. So the Gophers, it's hard to say they're the favorites, right, when his home state, Nebraska, wants him badly. But this kid would slide instantly in to starting in the backcourt. I mean, if this kid came here, your new starting backcourt would be Mike Mitchell Jr., the transfer from Pepperdine at the one, Wrightsell Jr. at the two. Awesome stuff. We'll talk to you for more scoopage on Reckless Speculation Thursday, my man. Thanks, Dukes. You got it. One more just to carry on the tradition. I heard from somebody down in Fort Myers, Polanco and Winder and Kirilov all feeling good today coming off playing last night. Polanco had a single. Kirilov had a single. Winder threw. I don't know how many pitches he threw, but he hit 94 on the radar gun. Of the three, it certainly appears as if Polanco is the closest to helping the big league team. Awesome. Okay. See you, boys. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks, Dukes.